I'm Craig, one of your pastors on staff. Uh, thank you for joining us today. If it's your first time, thank you for making New Hope uh, your choice of church home. And welcome to all of those who are watching via simulcast uh, and at our campus in Bel Air, Michigan. Pastor Bob and Amy, we greet you as well in Jesus' name. And now we turn uh, in your Bibles, open it please to Isaiah chapter 40. Awesome. This is the uh, 21st message in the series of Isaiah. And uh, most churches don't go through this book. It's lengthy, but this is a 21st message. And as we go through the book of Isaiah, we kind of broke it up in themes. So we're not going chapter 1 through 66 consecutively. Uh, but the first theme was the problem of sin, sermons that directly address the problem of sin. Then we move to the second theme, the arrival of Messiah, chapters that specifically talk about the coming of Jesus Christ. This third theme that we're in is called the hope of redemption. So these are chapters that mingle a hope in the midst of what is going on in terms of the culture. And boy, do we ever need hope today in our culture as well. Have you ever felt... Uh, let's get to the realm of human emotions real quick because uh, this chapter is a phenomenal chapter about the character of God and how awesome God is. At its core, it addresses a common human issue, a common human dilemma. So let me frame it like this. Have you ever felt that God is distant as the world seems to fall apart? Have you ever felt that God is not paying attention even though you're praying to him? Have you ever felt that God doesn't care about maybe what is going on in your individual life? Maybe he's got bigger issues to tend to, and somehow he's ignoring your issues. Have you ever felt that God is indifferent to pain, or that perhaps God has abandoned you to fend for yourself? Have you ever felt that God isn't listening to you? Uh, some of those frame the human dilemmas. Uh, let me illustrate it like this. Uh, in our home, uh, my children, our children, and myself somewhat jokingly say that we feel that God listens to Corey more than he does to us. We liken it to cell phone coverage. We think that somehow, some way, my wife has got like four bars, like full coverage with God, and that sometimes like we're out between Kalkaska and Grayling, like in that like no service area. Have you ever felt like that? That for some reason it feels like your prayers are blocked or God doesn't care or God is not listening. Well, Isaiah chapter 40 is one of the most well-known, well-loved chapters in the Bible. Uh, it is quoted by presidents. It inspires wall art. It's posted on your Instagram and Facebook accounts. And it is all about the awesome character of God. But the reason Isaiah preaches this message, listen close. The reason he preaches this is because at the core, the people had lost perspective about who God is and they were complaining that he didn't care. I want to go to the heartbeat of this passage, the, the context. Look at it. Verse 27, here is the context of this passage. This is the one verse. Listen close. It is the one verse in this chapter that voices the complaint of the people. Everything else is a sermon from Isaiah. <laughs> it all surrounds this complaint. Here it is, verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob... And speak, some translations will say complain. Why do you complain, O Israel? And here is the complaint. The complaint is this. My way is hidden from the Lord. And my right is disregarded by my God. In other words, God doesn't care. Why does the Lord not listen to me? Why is what I'm going through, either personally here in the context or probably as the nation of Israel, why is it that we are praying and God doesn't care? Character of God. And that complaint drives Isaiah crazy. And so he preaches a sermon that has inspired believers in all generations. It supersizes our view of God and it right-sizes our view of self. 
Here's what Isaiah does in this, in this chapter. Uh, here's the, the threefold breakdown is the greatness of God is considered, the authority of God is compared, and the strength of God is promised. And in this progression through this, we're going to go from really, really, really big God, and then he's going to move it all the way down to the personal level of the strength that God promises to give, the very personal strength as the cosmic God, creator, everlasting God of the universe comes down to main street level and he promises that he gives strength to those who wait upon the Lord. So here is the progression. Isaiah chapter 40, the greatness of God is considered. Look at verse 12. We begin with verse 12 when Isaiah says this, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? And marked off the heavens with a span, and enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance. Okay, just stop for a moment and consider the greatness of God. Who has done this? I mean, who? think about this. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. Consider the seven great oceans and the five great lakes and take all of the water of this world and it's like a teaspoon in the hand of God. Who's done that? And not only that, who has marked off the heavens with, with simply the measurement of his hand? I mean, that's incredible. Uh, The the distances that are incomprehensible to us of the galaxies upon galaxies upon galaxies. And, and, And Isaiah says, who simply, like a fisherman, hey, how big was a fish you caught? Yeah, that big. And Isaiah says, the God of the universe looks at the universe that he created. How big is the universe, God? And God's like, hmm, that big. Who has done that? And who has taken the mountains of the world, the Alps, the Himalayas, the Rockies, all of them that we look at in our mouth, gapes in wonder and awe at the greatness of the majestic mountains, and we feel so small compared to them. And who has taken those mountains and simply like pebbles on a scale and measured them? Or who has taken the sands of the earth from all the great sand dunes and the dunes across the world and simply seals them up in a Ziploc bag. Who has done that? I want you to consider the awesome greatness of God and and ask ourselves, why is it that we make mountains out of, help me, Why do we make mountains out of molehills when the creator of the mountains told Jeremiah, is there anything too hard for me? Why is it that we fret and worry and grow anxious or complain maybe that God himself doesn't care when in fact you sang the song perhaps as a kid? Help me out. He's got the whole world in his hands, right? So why do we fret and worry and grow anxious or complain that God doesn't care when in fact he does have the whole world in his hand? Consider the great power of God, amen? And then consider his wisdom, Verse 13 and 14, who has measured the spirit of the Lord, literally directed? Who has told the spirit uh, what to do or what man has shown him counsel? Whom did he consult or who made him understand? Who taught him? That is, who taught God the path of justice? Who taught the Lord knowledge and showed the Lord the way of understanding? In other words, paraphrase, who is God's life coach? I mean, who did God consult to get advice or, or direction on who could possibly show God a better way or who would be his teacher as if to instruct him in a way that would be better to run the universe or to run the affairs of your life? Who, who could possibly teach God anything? 
One of my favorite preachers, Erwin Lutzer, he stood on this stage last year. But uh, Erwin said this one day. He said, has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? If you don't understand that, it will occur to you later today. (laughs) But has it ever occurred to you? Nothing has ever occurred to God. Not one moment has the Lord ever thought, oh, I didn't think of that. (laughs) Who has taught it? And then consider this, that this great, big, powerful, all-wise, all-knowing God has given a great invitation in his word. And it says this, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach. You need wisdom? Many of you do. You're at a crossroads. Any of you lack wisdom? Ask the God of the universe who needs no instruction. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. Consider his greatness. And then consider how small we are. How small we are. Uh, Take a look at this. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Verse 17, all the nations are as nothing before him. They are counted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. All of the nations... Uh, in terms of size, from the biggest to the small, from Russia to Monaco, Uh, in terms of wealth, from gross domestic product, from the United States of America to the Federated States of Micronesia, all of them are as nothing to him. Isaiah says, it's like a drop from a bucket I'm going to ask for this camera. Okay, zoom in really close. Come here. Come here. Are you ready? You ready? Can you see it? Okay, ready? Here's Russia. Wait, wait. Here's 1.2 billion in China or in uh, India. Ready? Oh. Wait. Here's China. And yet Isaiah says all of the nations, all of them, Collectively, add them all up. Compared to God, nothing. Now, what's key here is this is not a statement of our significance. It's a statement of size. It's not a statement of our significance. Oh, trust me, we are incredibly significant to God. And Isaiah's going to get to that point. But he is comparing to us the greatness of our God. How big, 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 big God is. How small, 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 small we are. And all of the nations are accounted, he says, as nothing before him. This supersizes our view of God and it right sizes our view of self. And this is important that we have a right sized view of ourselves, not a degrading view of ourselves. The Bible says simply something like this It says, if anyone thinks of himself more highly than he ought, right? Nobody should think of themselves more highly than you ought, but rather we ought to think of ourselves with, what does the Bible say? With sober judgment. That we are created by a God of the universe who loves us and gave his life for us. We don't think of ourselves lofty or with arrogance or with pride, but we think of ourselves with sober judgment. That we were created by an almighty God who holds the world in his hand, who measures the universe by a span who collects the dust as if like in a Ziploc bag. And it is this God that loved us and gave his life for us, even though we're nothing in terms of size by comparison. This is radical truth. Consider the greatness of our God. Isaiah goes on. Consider, here it is, the authority of God compared. The authority of God compared. 
He goes on with developing this big theme. Uh, let's compare God to idols. Should we do that? Say yes. Let's compare him to idols. To whom then will you liken God or what likeness compare with him? An idol? <laughs> and then he goes on. You can take this off, verse 19 and 20. He, could, he, he talks about the development of idol. You take gold, you take silver, you take a really, really nice piece of wood that won't rot, and you form or fashion something, and then you set the idol in place, and the idol doesn't move. And it's almost like Isaiah's a little bit sarcastic. You want to compare God to an idol? To something that just sits there and doesn't move? How silly. I was in India years ago uh, with Ben. Ben and I were there. We had the privilege of uh, visiting one of the, the uh, uh, Hindu temples where we saw uh, many of the Hindu folks who had come to worship one of their uh, many millions of gods. And uh, this god, you had to walk up flights of steps that as, as, as these folks were walking up the steps, they were kissing every step on the way as they were going up to this room. And inside of this room, it was built up like a glorified place of worship and there was beating of drums. And in the front of the room was this elephant-like God painted black flowers all over them and they were worshiping this idol. It was around 11 o'clock that morning after we had been there for a little bit of time and they were asking all of the visitors to leave the Hindu temple. And through a translator, we asked why we had to leave. Literally, they said this, the God has to take a nap. <laughs> no joke. Every day at 11 o'clock, they ask visitors to leave because that's an hour he has to rest. My friends, we serve the living God. And anyone who has risen from the dead has credibility. And Isaiah says, you want to compare God to an idol? I, that's, that's silly. And, and you would say, well, you know, we're sophisticated Americans. We don't have idols like elephants. Well, we may not have elephants, but we have bulls. And the scripture is very clear in the aftermath of a week we've had on Dow Jones. Command those who are rich not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Put your hope in God. If you have lost value this week, and all many of you have, do not put your hope in the bull or the elephant or anybody. Put your hope in the living God. So let's compare God. Let's move on. Let's compare them to rulers, earthly rulers, leaders of this world. Isaiah says, do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like, read that, grasshoppers. I love this prophet. All of the nations, put them all together. It's like a drop of water from a bucket. You want to talk about the inhabitants or rulers of the world? All of them are like grasshoppers. Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. <laughs> Next verse says this. Who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither. He's talking about earthly rulers. You want to compare God to earthly rulers? The Bible says that the Lord sits above the circle of the earth by comparison, he looks down. All of its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Once again, I ask for the help of the camera. Can you see that? See that? There's, there's Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> there's, there's, there's Donald Trump. Right? And there's all the leaders that have gone before them. And there's me, and there's you, and... Just grasshoppers. You know, it's a great reminder as we approach another election cycle not to put your hope in the next leader, the next ruler. Have you ever plucked a dandelion that has flowered? 
or plucked a dandelion. It's got all the white little flowers, and, and one of the little things that you do with kids, right, is you hold the dandelion and you go, God. And Isaiah says, you want to compare God to rulers? Here's what God does with the rulers. Scarcely are they planted. Scarcely are they sown. Scarcely do they take root. And the Lord blows on them. And they wither. It's an amazing, amazing concept. Verse 25. Let's compare him to anyone or anything of importance. He says, to whom will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. The Lord says, go ahead, pick anyone, pick anything of importance and compare them to me in my greatness. He says, lift up your eyes on high and see. Lift up, look, look up at the stars. Who created these? He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. <laughs> Times Magazine had a list of all the important people of 2019, okay? The top leaders was Pelosi and Trump. The top icons were Taylor Swift and Lady Gaga. The top titans were LeBron James and Tiger Woods. The number one person of last century was Albert Einstein. And the Lord says, pick anybody you want, pick anything of importance, and then take a look up at the stars at night. Who did that? Who, who did that? And not only did he make them, he named them all. We can't eat, my friend, listen, I, I'm not even going to bother your mind, boggle your mind with numbers because we can't comprehend the numbers of the stars simply to say that there is 100,000 million stars in our galaxy alone. And they suggest times millions of galaxies. And the Lord Named every single one. It's incomprehensible to us. By the way, you can name a star for 40 bucks online. I looked it up this week. <laughs> Just say it. In the words of my friend Steve Green, God and God alone is fit to take the universe's throne. And this is what Isaiah is saying. Isaiah is quoting God here. Look up. Who created those? Compare God to idols. Compare them to rulers and leaders. Compare them to anyone and everything. And get this. There is only one leader, one ruler, who is fit to take the throne. His name is God. And yet... Just stop for a moment and consider that those stars which paint the sky at night caused King David probably to kneel. Imagine King David looking up at the stars of the galaxies. And David, he looks up and he says this. You've heard it, Psalm 8. He says, when I consider the heavens and I look at the work of your hands, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him, yet you have made him a little lower than the angels? What's remarkable in Isaiah 40 is not that, I mean, it's remarkable that God has all power to create the stars and name all of the galaxies and do all of that. But what's really remarkable is that that great big, awesome, powerful, all-knowing, all-wise, all-authority God actually loves me. And he cares about us way more than the stars. This is awesome. And by the way, all of this chapter revolves around the complaint. Don't forget it. It revolves around the very next verse. The complaint is God doesn't care about me. 
God's not hearing my prayers. My way is hidden from the Lord. To which Isaiah says, baloney. That's the message paraphrase, right? <laughs> baloney. Consider how great God is and how small we are. Compare him to anyone and everything of great importance. And this is the great big God of the universe. And you're complaining that your little problem is going unnoticed. And so he boils all of this down to the strength of God promised to people like you and me who were complaining just moments ago that God doesn't care, God doesn't see. And here's the complaint again. Now we're back up to our context. Why do you say, O Jacob, why do you complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God. Why do you say that? Why do you complain against God? And now comes the most famous part of this whole book, almost of the whole Bible. He says these words, have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Consider this, that the God who has all power and all authority do you really think that he is too tired or unable to help you in your current need? Or consider that this God who has all wisdom, do you really think that this God of all wisdom lacks the wisdom to help you and to give you wisdom in your hour of distress? Or consider that this God who has all authority do you really think that God is not in control and guiding the universe and the cosmos and all things for the sake of his glorious name? This God who is never weary, he never takes a nap, he rules big things and little things, and this is where the words of Christ come to the very focal point. Do you remember when Jesus said this? Do not worry about your life. Consider the birds of the air, the flowers of the field. The birds do not sow or reap, but your Father feeds them. Your heavenly Father feeds them. Will he not also feed you? For you are of much more value than the birds. Isn't that awesome? This Christ who is God in the flesh, incarnate, says to us, in light of this everlasting God that we serve, the creator of the ends of the earth, who created the birds and the mountains and the stars and the galaxies, everything in between, the flowers of the field, this God who cares for the flowers and the birds and everything says... So do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or drink or wear, for your heavenly Father knows you need them. Is God good? And so here we have the strength of God promised. Verse 29, this is what the Lord says. You guys know this one. This is what is on your Facebook and Instagram. Here it is. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, what does he do? He increases strength. Even youths, young people, shall faint and be weary. Young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord, some translations hope for the Lord, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This passage is so popular it has been quoted almost by everybody, including these four people. Here, take a look at these. President Trump quoted this last year in the Rose Garden. If you like President Obama, he quoted this 2011 at a prayer breakfast. If you like Bill Clinton, he quoted it last year at a funeral of Elijah Cummings. If you like President Bush, notice this one right here. 2005 inauguration, see this open Bible? 
You see that? Say yes. He specifically opened it to Isaiah 40, this passage in 2005, to take his second inauguration to specifically say, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. But it's one thing to quote it. It's another thing to believe it. The strength of God is promised. Isaiah, here... Now step back from the passage, okay? Verse 27, the complaint. God doesn't care. God isn't listening to me. Now step back from the passage. Here's the big picture. The greatness of God is considered. How big God is. How small we are. He has all authority. Compare him to idols. Compare him to rulers. Compare him to anyone and everything. Our God is awesome, isn't he? And now Isaiah boils it down from the the level of the stars to the level of the streets. He goes from the glory of the heavens to the burdens of the home. He goes from the galaxies to the problems that we have with which we come before God and we need strength and help and hope. And Isaiah says, this great, big awesome, powerful, all-wise God, he promises, he promises he will give strength when you are exhausted. When you are at a point, when you feel that marathon cannot be finished, you're at mile 18, you're at mile 20, and you have no strength to move on, Isaiah says that the God of the universe somehow, some way, infuses his strength and his energy to give you perseverance, to help you endure, to carry on another day. When you feel like you cannot last one more moment in life, this somehow, I, somehow in God's mysterious power, he infuses strength to take one more step, last one more year, to carry on, to persevere, to endure. And this God of the universe, he loves you. He loves you. So why would we complain that God isn't listening? Why complain that God doesn't care when the God of the universe has promised to give strength to those who wait for him, hope for him, plead with him, ask him for strength? We want to give that opportunity uh, because folks we recognize carry burdens in their life. Some have come in here today heavy laden. And you're just at a simply, uh, you're frankly, you're at a point right now where it's like, Lord, I need your strength. I need your strength. We're going to have uh, prayer partners providing that opportunity simply to pray Isaiah 40 for you. If you've never received prayer, it's nothing weird. We just want to have prayer partners pray Isaiah 40 specifically and individually for anybody who would want to come forward and say, hey, my name is Craig. I got this troubling news and I need prayer for God's strength. This is not a counseling session. Everybody say, got it? Got it. This is a chance for you to say your name and what you need strength for in like 15 seconds. And then the people will pray specifically and individually for you. And Isaiah says, strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. So do you need God's strength today? Are you at a place right now where you are weary? You are burdened? Maybe your perspective of God has has fallen aside. Maybe he's lost credibility with you. You're at a place right now where you say, you know what, whatever's going on in my life, I need prayer for this. I need God's strength for this. I need endurance for this. I need to wait upon the Lord for this. Would you be willing uh, just to simply come and receive uh, prayer? Would you bow your heads? Our prayer partners uh, are gonna come down to the front of each aisle. And uh, during this closing song, the action step for you would be to receive prayer for strength that you need. So prayer partners, take your place. Uh, In congregation, let's pray together 
as a whole. Father, we now commit uh, to you uh, this time. Lord, I know that there's going to be very tender moments right here. There will be very tender, beautiful moments as the people of God pray that you would give them strength and hope and endurance. We praise you for Isaiah 40, this great, powerful message of how great, big, mighty you are and how much you care for people like us. Thank you that as we pray to you, that you hear us and that you will promise to give strength.